speaker, uh, Rob Warwick. Um, What's interesting uh, about Rob is that uh, he really demonstrates that now, with uh, relatively minimum efforts and practically no capital, anybody can start successful software business. Not only start, but run. So every developer, and I used to be one of them, has great ideas thinking, what do I do about it? How can I do it? Oh, I need to find salespeople. I need to find business people. How do I need to talk to VC? Rob will show you that it's not necessary, that's what you need to do. You can just go and do it. Okay, it was successful. Um, I also uh, suggest that you guys uh, check uh, Rob's blog, Software by Rob. Uh, it's one of the uh, most popular startup blogs. Very interesting blog. And I mentioned his book, Start Small, Stay Small. And his book is selling over there. Uh, it's really a uh, great. Uh, it's not a recipe, of course, but at the same time, it's very practical steps how that can help you to your business, and I'm using it in my startup as well. Rob? Sorry about that audio blast, guys. Things wired up. Can everyone hear me now? Or, yeah, it's pretty good. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I want to thank Michael um, and Agile Vancouver for inviting me. I'm super stoked about the speakers today, honestly. I feel like the, uh, the low guy and the totem pole, because there's, um, there's some really cool stuff that's going to happen today. I uh, met all the speakers last night at dinner, and um, there was some pretty riveting discussion that I'm hoping continues you know, in the sessions today. So as Michael said, uh, I'm Rob Walling. You can get me on Twitter there. Let me try to hide my... Um, Um, I encourage people to, to tweet, include my um, username, and my Twitter handle, and uh, you know, I, after the talk, if you have questions or anything, obviously come up to me or I'll answer them on Twitter. I wanted to congratulate Vancouver on the Canucks. Uh, I've been here for about a week, and uh, this is heading north out of Vancouver up to the Capilano, um, the big suspension bridge you guys have, and there were Canucks jerseys on both of the, the Lions, and since I'm, I'm from California, we don't have a hockey team, well, we do in San Jose, but not where I live. I've been living vicariously through you guys for the past several weeks, so this is, this is awesome. Now, I have someone um, near and dear to me who I brought, brought with me, and he had something he wanted to say about Vancouver, and we're from Fresno, to give you a little uh, insight, and he'll, he'll mention that during this. Hopefully a small portion. But I have six points that I'm going to make today, and my hope is that 
uh, there are there are definitely going to be some people where all six of them are just going to be like you know right right with you. And I recommend you know checking out my blog and, and let's chat. Um, and my goal is that at least one point resonates with with everyone in the room. So my background is I'm a software developer. I've uh, been developing, writing code for about 10 years. I still identify myself as a developer. What that means is I get really fucking nervous when I'm doing presentations, so I apologize for that in advance. Um, I enjoy doing it, but uh, I'm not a public speaker. I don't get paid for this. Um, I do it because I really enjoy entrepreneurship, and I love, I love interacting with entrepreneurs in person. Uh, it goes beyond my blog and you know whatever else uh, I do online. This is, this is kind of where the rubber meets the road, in my opinion. Um, so I, I had a very successful, well, in my opinion, I had a, a successful consulting firm that I ran for several years, made great money, and I shut it down because it didn't meet with my, my personal goals. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little later. Now I own a, a portfolio of websites and <coughs> software products, um, and that's, that's how I make my full-time living. And uh, I have a fairly popular blog, and I wrote a book, as Michael said. So today I'm going <coughs> to... As I said, I'm going to be talking about lessons I've learned moving from developer to entrepreneur. And the first lesson I'm going to talk about is to know yourself. So, so in 2004, I, um, I was 29 years old, and um, I was a consultant, and I despise being a consultant. It was, it's, it's a hamster wheel for anyone who does it. You'll know what I'm talking about. It's basically rushing from one contract to the next. You think it's going to be great when you leave your salary job, and then you get to it, and it sucks, basically. At least, at least for me. Um, I was offered a job, full-time job working for the city of Pasadena, making great money for a 29-year-old. And so I jumped on it. And I'm, to me, it was like, you don't have to figure out what makes you happy. If, if you make a lot of money, you're going to be happy. right? You're, I can write code. I can manage some people and just hang out and do some stuff. Now, the problem with this is... Um, I quit after seven months, and it takes six months to find someone into the city of Pasadena and, and to get them working. So I felt pretty bad for my bosses, and I, I you know, took on a bunch of guilt and stuff. And I was actually uh, pretty depressed for the year leading up to this because I hated consulting. I was depressed for another couple of years, um, not but just, just really kind of upset and uh, you know, not enjoying it. And I couldn't figure out what the, why was I not happy. I was writing code, which I love to do. I was, uh, I was interacting with entrepreneurs. I, there was something missing, and there was this money coming in, so why, you know, why was I not happy? And I realized that, um, that I needed to quit the day I talked to someone who had worked for the city for about 10 years. And I said, I, I hate this job. You know, I've been here like five months. I hate this job. And he said, oh, I do too. And I said, well, why are you here? And he said, it's only 17 more years until I retire with a full pension. <laughs> And that's when I realized, like, I have, I have to do something. I'm not like this guy. I'm not like the, you know, not everyone in the city is like that, right? It's, it's a good city. But uh, I realized that, that um, I wasn't going to last doing this. So what I also realized that the paperwork was, was going to kill me. If anyone who's ever worked for, for city government. So what I, oh, next I, I moved to consulting. Again, making good money. I was working from home, still trying to figure out why, why I'm so. So over the course of about four years, I should have had what in my head was always going to be my happy place. It was either you know working uh, for the local government or being an entrepreneur, working as a consultant, and uh, nothing was nothing was working for me. So what I learned during this time is that there are some very specific strengths that each of us have. I'm going to talk briefly about my four, not to um, not because you care, because you shouldn't care what my strengths are, but to give you an example of why I was so unhappy. So the first thing um, I learned about myself is that I'm a learner, and I constantly need to learn new things, and that was not happening at the city or as a consultant. The next thing is I'm futuristic, so I look, I look ahead, and I think, wow, in 10 years, 17 years, what am I going to be doing? And I couldn't imagine working for the city in 17 years, nor consulting. I'm a maximizer, which means I, I bring things um, that are good, and I love to make them great. I hate working with really subpar things, which I wasn't doing at the government a lot. People who work, <coughs> and last, I learned that I'm a creator. I think a lot of people in this room probably show that trait. So, once I learned these things, I realized that I was doing the completely, the completely opposite of what I should be doing if I actually wanted to a be successful and b be happy. And no matter what you're doing. Um, 
no matter what your role is, whether you're starting a startup now, whether you're in the middle of it, whether you're just, just coming up with ideas, I personally know a handful, multiple, four or five people who are multimillionaires because they've started their startup, they've done what we, what we dream about, right? They started the startup, they sold it for a seven-figure exit, and they are now unhappy. And the reason they're unhappy is because they still haven't figured this out. They still haven't figured out what is it that, that's really going to make me happy. So once I figured this stuff out, I realized that maybe doing a startup, like a, a big, go big, you know, raise venture funding startup was not for me. And, and I, um, I didn't take that path. I'll talk more about it later in the talk. For those who are curious, this list of four, uh, there's actually five of them. I learned this from this book that's like nine bucks on Amazon. It's called StrengthsFinder 2.0. They give you a code in this book. Yeah, I mean, I don't make any money. I'm not trying to sell it, but this it has seriously had an impact on my life. And <clears throat> excuse me. And um, I recommend you do it. It takes 30 minutes to take this test, and then it spits back to you what you know, like what are your strengths? And these are the things that you're going to be really good at. That make you happy. So what I do now, as I said, is is I own smaller products. Um, I take care of my kids a couple days a week, and I do. I love what I do. I'm an entrepreneur. But um, I, I basically taken advantage of all these things. I, I own about a dozen products and websites, I'm const so I'm constantly learning. I'm futuristic because I can, I can look down the line and say, wow, what am I going to build next? What am I going to acquire next? I'm in control of that destiny. Uh, I'm a maximizer because I, I acquire a lot of these products that are kind of in shambles at the time, and then I improve them, so you know, it feeds into that. And then I'm a creator because, again, I can, I can create new products. Uh, I'm in control of my destiny. So, for me, this has resulted in me being happier. I actually make less money than at some of my, my previous jobs, but I'm way happier now than was. <coughs> and as a, a daily reminder to myself, um, I actually had this tattooed on my wrist about six months ago because um, this is what I need to do every day. If I don't create something, then, uh, then I find that I, I'm not happy in the long run. So, that's, that's lesson number one. The next thing I learned, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna get some water. So that was 2004, that was about seven years ago, and I'm gonna go basically, you know, chronologically for the most part. Um, the next thing I learned, and this was a hard lesson for me to learn, is that being a good developer is not enough to succeed as an entrepreneur. Or why marketing trumps everything. I don't know if, uh, has anyone ever been to this website? It's called scriptcopy.com. And essentially what it is, is it's uh, clone scripts of most of the popular applications that, that you would use. And you can go to Google and just type in PHP clone script, and you'll find like 50 sites like this. And, um, is there a laser pointer? No, but, but you can see, I mean, you read through this, it's like Elance, eHow, eBay, Amazon. Google and, or Gmail, Google. Now these aren't fully fledged, you know, uh, complete duplicates of Google. But what people have done is essentially duplicated the UI and, and built these apps. So if you want to start um, a Groupon competitor, don't go code this thing from scratch. Go here, click on that, and it's like 99 bucks to buy these scripts. Some of them are free. Some are 49 bucks. Whatever. Once I found this, I realized, oh no. That my, like this would take me six months to, to build, right? Each of the, if I was going to start a group on competitor, I would have sat down, I would have written a data model, I would have talked to my developer buddies, and we would have started building things. But it's not worth very much. Writing this code is really not, uh, doesn't actually create much value. And as developers, we tend to think that, that the code is, is the valuable part of this business. There's a business called PHP My Realty, and a couple guys got together and they spent six or nine months, and I had a great idea. The great idea was to create a real estate listing directory um, written in PHP. It's going to be revolutionary, and they built it, and it works. Um, it's a phpmyrealty.com. And it's a good idea for a, you know, for a nice software business, a nice software company. But they quickly got burned out. They found out they couldn't make sales. Um, marketing's harder than it seems. And so they, they decided to put it up for sale. And this is a story, I'm going to run through about six or seven of these yeah, pretty quickly. But they put it up for sale, and you, you think about this, right? It's like six man months. Well, no, it was two guys. It was like 12 man months of work. 
So there has to be some value there. And the auction ended up sold. No one made it. And I didn't get on it either. Next one uh, is called Kudo CMS. So it's a fully fledged CMS system. It sells for 25 bucks. It's kind of a low end software product. But again, these guys, these guys were making some revenue. Uh, I think it was like 100 bucks a month at the time. And they went to sell it and they got <clears throat> $250 for this thing. This is an entire business. They're giving away all rights. They, it's not that they're selling you a copy of the script. They're selling you a software company, essentially. Okay, hostile mate is another one. It's, I had actually had this on my idea list at the time. It was like, it's an underserved market, ins and hostels, and you create the management software for them. So again, uh, they wanted five grand for it, they didn't get anything. Uh, DropConf, which was one I, I was bidding on at the time. Um, it's a conference calling service. Again, 2,500 bucks. Um, an admin user interface. This, this one's actually kind of cool, and this one was bringing in a couple grand a month. And uh, the guy, had a minimum bid of 20 grand and no one, no one bid on it. If anyone's curious, this website, the eBay of, um, essentially it's the eBay of the websites and software products, it's called flippa.com. And that's where all these listings come from. I've learned, I have taken on an entire uh, college education just being on Flippa and watching these sites come through, realizing that I don't want to go down this path. Because a lot of startups do wind up going down this path, unfortunately. And then here's the uh, kind of the coup de grace, blendedall.com. It's an affiliate website for blend tech. You guys have heard of the, the, the YouTube videos where they blend the iPhones and they blend the, what's, the, yeah, it's called the Will It Blend. That's what blend tech is. And so they have like $700 blenders. Blendedall.com is an affiliate website for these guys. And they went to sell, sell the website. It's like a 10, 15 page website, okay? They put up WordPress, they put up some good content, they build links, it's legitimate stuff. Um, it's not crap content, but it's an affiliate site. And they sold it for $20,000. Now you compare this to what we've seen with the other apps that we would have put hundreds or thousands of man hours into, person hours into. Um, and what's the difference? Well, the, the real difference is that these guys were actually making, oops, these guys were making 1300 bucks a month, okay? So it's about a 16 times monthly, uh, multiple of their monthly. The moral here, well, there's a couple morals. One is, until you've started achieving revenue, you have not created much value. You can, we can argue that Facebook and Twitter and you know these these get big startups are in a different boat, maybe. But as we're, we were actually talking at dinner last night, they are considered the truly disrupt. Those are considered truly disruptive startups, right? And there are very very few of them, and very very few of them are going to succeed. For the rest of us, for the other 95%, until you start achieving revenue, until you achieve cash flow, you create little, if any, value. Okay, and this is something that so many people forget, including myself. And Flippa reminds me of that every week when I'm on there looking at the sites. The thing, I have this written down, I should get this tattooed on my arm too, but I have this written down in my office, and the quote is, if my app was done today, how would I work? I always think that. I come up with an idea and I think, oh man, I totally want to build that. And I think, all right, <clears throat> I'm going to imagine that someone shows up my, at my door and hands me a five and a quarter inch floppy disk, you know, the old floppy disks, and um, it has that entire code base on it, and it's done, and the design is done, and the sales website is done. The hell would I do with that? And I put myself in that mental <coughs> space of thinking, what is my next step after that? Because that's the stuff that creates value. Most people in this room have used offshore labor. I use offshore labor for some of my stuff, and I can duplicate most apps, that, especially the ones I see on Flippa, but I can duplicate most apps for 10 or 20 grand, six to, to seven months tops. Um, I can't duplicate Google, right? We, we can't duplicate something with a, a heavy algorithmic element to it, but most of the apps that I see people working on are, are not that. Most of them are easy enough to either buy on script copy or basically, you know, hire developers and do it for relatively cheap. The value is not created there. The value is created once you have the app done, how do you start marketing it? Okay. And as a bonus, every time you mention one of these uh, ways of marketing, you get kid gets run over by a riot mower. If you say you're gonna submit it to TechCrunch, um, that's yeah, I've blogged about this a lot. You'll get fifty thousand drive by visitors and you'll get one sign up. 
So that's not a revenue source. Okay. Um, emailing bloggers used to work, maybe, but these days it's, it doesn't. So it's much more about relationships. Viral marketing, if you know how to do it, works really well. Most people don't. It might take you 10 or 20 tries. Um, so that's, that's not a revenue source or a marketing source either. Advertising can work. <clears throat> Talk a little later about, about a, way, uh, a way to make it work. But um, in general, it should be seen as a, as a short-term short -term approach to, to getting to monetization. <clears throat> Software developers don't have to talk this much in an entire day, so my throat is very strange. <laughs> um, and, and Facebook and Twitter. So these are all, Facebook, yeah, it's great, it can be 5% of a, of a revenue base, but same with Twitter, it's like, you know, you build relationships, you can bring in a little bit of traffic, but these things are not, these are not core revenue sources, they're not core marketing approaches. So that was lesson two, is that no value is created until you start marketing. All right. Uh, lesson number three, this is the third lesson I learned moving for developer on the door, and it's why the traditional approach to sizing a market is wrong. Now, back in 2005, I had a great idea for an app. Blogging was huge. There were like a gazillion new blogs a day. And I think the number was like 10,000 at the time. 10, 20,000, I don't know. There was a lot of new blogs every day. So, why not to build something to take advantage of this and uh, make a profit? I wanted to buy a beach house. I lived in Southern California, and it wasn't this particular beach house, but certainly um, that would have been nice. So I really did, you know, I think when we, when we start our startups, we have this vision of, of what, what it's going to do, and uh, I really did think it was, it was going to be big. So I launched a service, it shows you how clueless I was just six years ago. I launched a service called FeedShot.com, and it allows people to submit their blogs to blog search engines. And at the time, this uh, sounds really cheesy now, but six years ago, there were a bunch of, there were like 35 blog search engines that people were doing it manually. And so create a tool and charge $3 and you'll make millions. So this is the site. I don't own it anymore. But um, I built it and I spent like six months of my time, not just building it, but marketing it and, and uh, doing all the things that kittens get run over by writing orders for. And uh, essentially, let's see, after about, um, Three months in total, I had a solid 4,000 unique visitors. And this isn't that great, but at the time, I didn't know anyone, and I didn't know any better. And you know, it, seemed, it seemed kind of cool. I had a pretty big viral launch. People were excited, and there were an SEO, or what was it? It was Search Engine Watch, and a couple other search engine sites were really stoked about this thing. They were linking to it, and I was like, well, this is the ticket, right? I'm totally going to make millions. And so it made 100 bucks a month for years, and then I sold it. But there's a couple things I've taken away from it. One, I'm amazed at how frequent that this exact pattern is, is repeated uh, by myself and then by entrepreneurs who I work with now. It's, it's the thought that the market is very big, so I'm going to build something for it, and I'm going to make money. And this is my downsized uh, beach house expectations after only getting 100 bucks a month. So I look back at this now, and I realize that I made several mistakes. and. I thought that they were isolated ones that somehow I was, um, well, that I just, you know, made them without, that I had made them independently of everyone else and that no one else would, would share these mistakes. And as I've worked with over the past several years, I've realized that this, this pattern is repeating. So that's why I bring these up today. Going for a horizontal market from the start if you don't have venture funding or a, a sizable, uh, knowledgeable amount of, of money and good management staff is really really hard. I would say nine possible. Um, so I always recommend starting with verticals, and that's what I do now. I don't want to go with verticals. Uh, I mean, it almost goes without saying, but a $2 price point, one-time fee, it's just embarrassing, right? There's no way you're ever going to you sell millions of these things. And there's no way you're ever going to do it. Um, so higher price points. I always offer higher price points now, and I always offer recurring purchases. I have businesses that I don't start because I cannot make them businesses. Um, and the bottom line is with a two dollar price point there's really no way to market it and turn a profit. Because you can't advertise at that at that price if you don't have the back end. There's there's no way to do this. So what I learned is that 
the top-down approach of, um, I have a friend who, who got his MBA and he was telling me, yeah, you know, the top-down approach is when you look at, um, you look at large demographics and, and you look at the top and then you say, all right, there's this many people in the market, how am I going to reach them? And I realized that, okay, if I have uh, millions of dollars to market, then yes, I can look at the top-down approach. But I have, I'm an independent developer and it's me and another guy, maybe it's three or four other people, and we, we don't really have a big budget. you got to go from the bottom up. And the way to go to the, from the bottom up is to look at not who can use it, but who is actively looking for this solution. And one way that I do that is this is, uh, this is actually the number of Google searches for these terms. And this is a, an interesting indicator if you look at it. Aside from the one that says blog platforms, which is, is irrelevant, when you look at the, the number of monthly searches for these terms that I was trying to target, and uh, you know it's like a couple hundred people. You add them all up, there's maybe 500. 700 people a month, and that's what the site was getting by the end. It was getting 800 or 900 visitors a month. Um, so starting with this bottom-up approach, I realized that, <coughs> you know, if, if, if I'm bootstrapping the company, if I don't have uh, an outgoing sales force, and I'm not doing cold calls, that this is where I have to start, and this is where I have to start calculating my revenue from, from, you know, from day one until I can build it up into something bigger. People aren't looking for what you have, even if there is a market for it. is that um, there's, well, there's a lot of debate about this point. It's, do you learn from your successes, or do you learn from your failures? Or do you learn from both, or neither, or more from one than the other? And there is this ongoing debate. 37 Signals has been involved in it, and uh, there's it's a lot of podcasts and blogs talk about it. And I learned that you learn from your successes and your failures. And I think I learned more from my successes. I'm going to play a little video here. Um, Anyone know who Ira Glass is? You guys, yeah, so there's a show called This American Life. It's on the National Public Radio in the States. And uh, Ira Glass has been doing it for about 15 years. And he's just a very, one of those very sage-like people. Um, very smart guy. And he's, he talks, this is just about a 90-second video clip. So much of what he says when he talks about becoming a broadcaster, uh, either on the radio or, or making, making television shows, is, um, is applicable to creating, to, to building a startup. And so, um, I mean, the guy really is an entrepreneur. So I'm going to play this really Failure is a big part of um, success. I sound like some Michael Jordan there, but like, you know what I mean? Like, like you're going to like run a lot of stuff and it's going to go nowhere. And that's, you should be happy about that. If you're doing that, you're doing it great. If you're not failing all the time, you're not creating a situation where you can get super lucky. And basically, like a lot of video and radio production, a lot of broadcasting, is just in it, the purest way about luck. Like really, you just want to be in a situation where you're doing enough material, where you're doing enough interviews every week, where like you have put yourself on a schedule so that you know every week you're going to interview somebody about something. And through that, once a month, maybe once every six weeks, you're going to stumble on somebody who is so compelling and a story that's so great that it makes those other five weeks worth it. And I don't know, it's like people don't talk about this that much. That you have to kind of going, go into it knowing that you've got to reward and get rid of a lot of crap before you're going to get to anything that's special. And you don't want to be making mediocre stuff. You know what I mean? Like, that's not why anybody gets into this. The only reason why you want to do this is because you want to make something that's so like, memorable, it's special. Um, and that's what you want to do. So there's, there's a couple things I like about it. One is the, um, he says you're going to have to throw a lot of stuff away in order to, to, get, you know, to get to the good stuff. And there's going to be a really good customer talk later this afternoon, it's going to gonna go into that. The other thing I like about it is that he basically says, you know, you, you do have to fail fast. Um, we've all heard that before. But, you know, in hearing this, and, and in hearing it both from Ira Glass and just write every blog you read over the past five years, um, I learned a lot about, uh, looking back, I really took a post more when I look back at my successes and failures, and I picked out some specific things that, uh, that I took away from them. So, in 2003 or four, no, in 2004, I launched a, a startup with another guy, and um, it was called Flogs.com, and it's like the worst idea and the worst name ever. It's Dig for Personal Finance News, and I'm really embarrassed about this now. 
It seemed like, I swear, it seemed like a good idea. Everyone was doing the deep thing, right? It was the social news thing. It was get people to vote stuff up, and it's viral traffic, and social media. And I mean, this is it's like 2004, 2005. No one knew what this stuff was going to do. And so it just seemed like everything was going to grow infinitely. And, and Dick got pretty big, and so did Reddit. And vlogs did not. And it, was, uh, it lasted about six months. Again, it was six months of my nights and weekends. And, you know, it's the whole um, several thousand dollar investment. And it was just a big failure. And I took a couple things away from this that I, again, I didn't get until years later kind of looking back at it. One is that I didn't feel any kind of demand. This goes back to the same thing with feed shot, is that if you're not solving someone's problem, solving a pain point, it's really hard to get traction. Um, even if you spend 20, 30 hours a week for six months, all I did, because oh, speaking of this, <clears throat> Blogs is, um, I didn't write any code for this. It's actually an open source framework, you know. I didn't go to script copy, but that's kind of where you get these days. So I didn't write code for this, even though I was a developer. So all I did for six months was try to market this thing. And never got more than, I didn't even know, it was a few hundred visitors a month. Because I didn't solve anyone's problem. People would come to the site, they come once, and then, and then they leave. Because it, no one had the need for aggregated personal finance news. No one really wants personal finance. Um, even though I do, right? Uh, the other thing is knowing how to reach customers. Um, having a specific track, this goes back to the, the writing mower thing. Now I look at things like search engine optimization and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and niche advertising as kind of the, the go-to ways when I'm, when I'm starting a new business. I mean, these are, are really the ways to find your audience. But I had no idea how to do that back then, and it was really, uh, you know, in 2005, it was a whole different landscape. So I, I had no idea how to reach customers, even though I, I thought I did. Email bloggers who did all those other silly things. And then, of course, knowing your revenue model, because my revenue model was ads, and ads don't count. And they don't. They just don't. I'm sorry. If you have, oh, if you have, uh, what was it? It was 10 million page views a month? Yeah, there, there's some point where it counts, but we're not there yet. So if you have a big site, then ads count. But otherwise, it's not a revenue model. It just, it just works. I've tried it a lot. Feed shot, I already went through this one. This was a fail. And what I learned was that low prices are really hard. One-time fees are no go. And uh, you know, the top-down approach of finding a big market really doesn't help you if people aren't actually looking for you and you don't have a way to get in, in the way of their traffic. Uh, the next one is uh, an app called .NET Invoice. It's invoicing software written in Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's written in .NET. All right, thank you. Let's see. Sometimes my jokes don't work, but uh, I want to see if anyone was awake. Um, <clears throat> so, .NET Invoice, I, I actually acquired this. It was in shambles. It was an alpha product they were trying to sell and um, had a bunch of pissed off customers. And I went, this was the first successful product I had. Um, it wasn't a huge win. It was a few thousand bucks a month, but at the time it was like, oh, this can work. This actually works. You know, after having these failures, there are, there are a bunch of other failures I can go into, by the way, because they same thing over and over and over. And why I didn't learn them before I got to .NET Invoice, I don't know why. So what I learned from .NET Invoice is that horizontal markets are hard. We've actually tried to expand .NET Invoice into a horizontal market, meaning invoicing for small businesses. And we got our asses handed to us. It is painful. Um, fresh books, blink sales, simply, it's just, it's so crowded. It's really hard. Again, if I had some funding, I know I could do it, but um, vertical niches are great. We really have a great uh, opportunity or, or a great sales channel with um, .NET developers. Because it's .NET Invoice, we provide the source code with the app. And so .NET developers, if they want to build invoicing, whether it's for themselves or whether they want to build it for a client, they come to us. So we have now started to cater the app. We haven't started. We've been working for a couple years. We just cater the app to developers. We keep giving more and more features that work for developers, for developers, for developers. Um, and this has now become our, our mainstay of uh, Steve Ballmer reference? Yeah, all right, yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> another developer in the house, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, vertical niches, vertical niches are the way to go. Um, higher prices are better. Dotnet invoice is three hundred dollars versus Feed Shop, which was three dollars. And what this allows us to do is it allows me to actually to do some advertising. It allows me to to do some things um, in terms of of marketing that I there's no way I could do with Feed Shop, right? Because it was two bucks a sale, three bucks a sale. 
when it's $300, you actually can get a, a reasonable ROI with AdWords, although I will have another bullet a little later. One time fee stuck. I'm going to say that a lot because this is, this is a big takeaway. Trying to build a business where on May 1st, what is it, May 3rd now? May, May 6th? Oh, I've been in Vancouver for a week. I'm losing time. May 1st, .NET invoice, you know what the sales for May, the outlook is? Zero dollars because it doesn't have recurring fees. So we have to hustle and we have to try to make our, our number this month because it's not a SaaS application. Again, I don't start non-recurring fee businesses anymore. I don't know how to, I need to get a recurring fee on the other list. <laughs> And then here's the thing, AdWords is not a sustainable, not a sustainable model. The problem is, is that Google is really smart and Google makes a shitload of money. And Google's algorithm is way smarter than us. And Google is gonna keep making more money because AdWords is gonna keep getting more expensive because that makes Google more money. So about three years ago, I would invest a dollar in AdWords for that invoice and I would make $2.10. It's a great way, right? You can just keep feeding it money, feeding it money. And I did. And then the 12 months went by, and it was $1.80 that I get back, and $1.50. And I'm trying to optimize it. I know AdWords. Like I, I'm not a, a newbie at this stuff. I lost $1,500 on AdWords in 30 days at one point, and I won't do it again. So over the course of about two and a half years, I was just, I was beaten out of the market. So we got to the point where we were getting $0.80 cents back for a dollar we invested. And this is not just my experience. I work with entrepreneurs who, who've also gone through this exact same experience where Either larger competitors enter the market and they just they totally draw up the AdWords cost and they make it so the ROI doesn't work for you. AdWords is a fantastic, uh, fantastic approach for driving quick traffic to your site, for testing out MVPs, minimum viable products, and um, for seeing if landing pages work. It's a great testing tool, but as a long-term revenue stream, even if you, know, if you guys have heard of uh, Patrick McKenzie, the bingo card creator guy, that used to be his main source and he has switched away from it. It it just doesn't. It's a loss later, essentially. And then SEO is long term. That's, that's what I've learned. That's a good way to go. Um, so this one I always question when I go to, uh, when I speak at startup conferences, I always question if I want to bring this one up. I own this website, and it's called JustBeachTowels.com, and it's a beach towel retailer. It's not a software company. But I went into it because I got a really good deal on it, and I just wanted to see what was going to happen. And I learned so much from this thing about marketing software and about marketing, how to do startup marketing, that I, I always opt to, to bring it up. So this was a win for me. When I bought it, it was nothing, it was just a domain name and like three pages of content. And I put a site on it and I found a drop shipper, I didn't want to have a towel, so someone drop shipped the towels. And I learned so much stuff, like SEO is awesome. This thing, when I bought it, got, uh, what was it? It was about 3,500 unique visitors a month. It isn't huge. But they were all targeted. They were searching for beach towels. So the conversion rate was the best of any business I had ever had. Um, all these other marketing approaches of emailing bloggers and, and getting on TechCrunch and all these other things, nothing compared to this search engine optimization, optimization of someone searching for beach towels, landing at my beach towel site, and well, sure enough, they want to buy beach towels. Like, this is not rocket science, but it, it had never connected with me. So the, the conversion rate was, was awesome. I learned that outsourcing is critical. I'm a big proponent of outsourcing. Uh, especially in, in early stage startups and for single and uh, small teams in general. Um, I do a lot of outsourcing. I have five different virtual assistants who work for me. They do audio editing, video editing, administrative stuff. Um, and I actually, I, there's a whole chapter in my book about, about this that's available for free online at Jason Cohen's blog. If you guys know a smart bear, um, go there and search for like personal assistant or virtual assistant. It's, you don't even have to buy my book. Um, but I talk specifically about some use cases that I've done that apply to startups. And not only why you should do it, but specifically how. I talk about how to hire and where to hire and blah, blah, blah. So I won't beat on this too much here, um, but I, I do believe it's important. It's definitely been a key to, to me being able to run you know, a bunch of businesses at once and stay sane and still watch kids. Um, low margin products are brutal. Beach towel is not, not a high margin software. 90% net margin. Beach towels, 15% net margin. So what I found is that investing a lot of money and a lot of time in marketing the beach towel site, it worked. It brought a lot of people. And I made $500 a month on it, which is not a lot compared to how many beach towels I sold. And so I realized if I took that time and invested it into a higher margin product, which at the time 
to be honest, the other one I owned was done in was that um, it would be a lot, it would be time better spent. And then physical products come with headaches. Most people probably doesn't apply here, but um, returns and lost shipments and all that stuff. So I tend to away from physical products. The last one, yeah, the last one I'm going to talk about is called CMS Themer. I acquired it, and basically it was a, a service for people who have a design, they have a PSD file, Photoshop file, and they want to turn it into a WordPress theme or a um, Joomla, Drupal, you know, kind of a, a CMS theme. And this was, this was a win for me as well. A couple things I learned were, I, I wound up selling it because it was too close to being a consultant. I don't sell most of my sites. I'm not like some flipper. I've only sold a couple of them and they don't work out. To, to, not working out for me can mean a lot of money, but not if it's taking too much time and it doesn't work. Um, so I did sell this one. And I learned that this was trying to productize this service was, was very challenging. And so going back to consulting was not, not in the cards. Clients are not good. Outsourcing is great, as I've already said. Now, with CMS Steamer, the price point was 500 bucks starting, and it went up from there, so if they wanted customization. We had a lot of orders in the 750 to 1000 dollars range. Advertising works would be surprisingly well for that. Um, niche advertising specifically. Uh, there's, a, there's a great niche ad network. There's two, actually. One's called buysellads.com. That's what I use for CMS Steamer. And I got typically a 3x return on my money with, with buy, sell ads. And then there's one that, that's called InfluAds that wasn't around then, but um, they're still like they, they market in the startup space, actually. So if you're targeting startups and um, personal development, and there's, there's a couple other niches that they cover. But niche advertising, I found, works much better than trying to go, well, trying to go big. And then I was shocked at, also at the conversion rates at CMS Theater with a high price point. Since I did solve a problem, you know, going back to, to Flogs, where I didn't solve anyone's problem, and it was a free service and no one used it. And now I have this service that costs 500 to 1,000 bucks. The order literally rolled in because um, because we solved people's problems. Because if they came there with a PSD, we could convert it. And uh, I realized that solving that pain point is a big deal. It's well knowing how to reach customers. Okay, so a brief intermission. Um, I just have two two lessons left. Um, I'll play a quick video here. I'm going to adjust the volume this time.
Uh, all, basically what he did is he sat down with the drums and he'd play something and then play it again and then he'd go into his editing software and spend hundreds of hours. I, mean, I have no idea how long that was. You know, 12 million views on YouTube. Right? <coughs> the guy doesn't know how to play the drums or the piano. And uh, it's called Amateur. Go on to YouTube and search for it. Because he goes in and plays this whole song on the piano and he stops starting, but I didn't want to let it play for another two minutes. Um, I can just imagine this guy sitting, you know, you, you sit there in your basement writing code and, and you move the, the notch forward like three, you spend three days and you move it forward three seconds on the timeline. Like you can imagine him sitting there. So, um, that's it. That's the only parallels to start touch lines. Because I find hearing myself talk for a few hours because being sleep, so. I wanted to be a great guy. Okay. Last two points, um, these two are quick, so we have about 15 minutes left, and uh, I'll take some questions at the end. Could we do, do Q&A if I have extra time? Um, we have 10 minutes break, so probably a oh. short break, so we can go. Yeah, yeah, no, I won't go over it all. Yeah. I have my trusty iPhone here. Um, okay, so the next lesson I learned, this was in, uh, This is Ira Blacks again. It's about a minute, a minute and a half. Nobody, uh, those people who are beginners, and I really wish somebody had told this to me, is that um, if you're watching this video, you, somebody wants to make videos, right? And all of us who do creative work, like, you know, we get into it, and we get into it because we have good taste. Do you know what I mean? Like, you want to make TV, because you love TV, you know what I mean? Because there's stuff that you just, like, love, okay? So you've got really good taste, and you get into this thing that, that I don't even know how to describe, but it's like there's a gap, that for the first couple of years that you're making stuff, what you're making isn't so good, okay? It's not that great. It's, it's really not that great. It's, it's trying to be good. It has some vision to be good, but it's not quite that good. But your taste, the thing that got you into the game, your, your taste is still killer, and your taste is good enough that you can tell that what you're making is kind of a disappointment to you, you know what I mean? Like you can tell that it's still sort of crappy. A lot of people never get past that phase. A lot of people at that point, they quit. And the thing I, I would just like say to you with all my heart is that most everybody I know who does interesting creative work, they went through a phase of years where they had really good taste, they could tell what they were making, it wasn't as good as they wanted it to be. They knew it felt short, you know, they, and, and like, it, some of us could admit that to ourselves, and some of us are a little less able to admit that to ourselves. But we knew, like, it didn't have this special thing that we wanted it to have. And the thing I would say to you is, everybody goes through that. And for you to go through it, if you're going through it right now, if you're just getting out of that phase, if you're just starting off and you're entering into that phase, you got to know that's totally normal. And the most important possible thing you could do is do a lot of work. Do a huge volume of work. Put yourself on a deadline so that every week or every month you know you're going to finish one story. You know what I mean? Whatever it's going to be. Like you create the deadline. It's best if you have somebody who's waiting for work for you, somebody who's expecting it from you. Even if it's not somebody who pays you, but that you're in a situation where you have to turn out the work. Because it's only by actually going through a volume of work that you're actually going to ca catch up and close that gap. And this will not be your last startup, whether it succeeds or fails. Like, you listen to Ira, who's been doing this for 20-something years, and, um, yeah, it's, A, your first, I, I, you know, looking back at my history, I realized that um, I'm glad I kept going. A bunch of them failed. A bunch of them that I haven't even talked about here failed. And, two, that it really, you really do get better at this stuff. Like, 10 years down the line, you really start knowing what the hell you're doing. So, in 2007, I'm now in New Haven, Connecticut. My wife is an intern uh, at Yale. And my life looks like I have an 18-month-old kid. I'm the primary source of income for the family. I'm still consulting at this time. And um, my wife works pretty heavy weeks as a psychologist. And I have very, very limited free time. It was actually like five hours a week. And, uh, but I love startups. Like, they've been in my blood for years. Um, always been an entrepreneur. And so I'm trying to get this next idea going, and I'm in, I'm in New Haven. Like, there's, it's Yale, right? There's a bunch of smart people there. Like, let's do some stuff. So what I should have done was do a small idea. And instead, I found two MBAs, and we applied for Y Combinator. And we got to the second or third round. Uh, we got to the part where we started, like, talking on the phone to people, which was kind of cool. 
Um, we tried three different startups that year. We just crammed them in. There was an angel investor who was interested. We, we, we went down the traditional route that you think of. And none of them worked out, which is fine. That's not to say you know, it never works out. But a big reason that it didn't work out is because I wasn't realistic about what I could do. Um, if you go back to what my life looked like, this is not conducive to me doing this, right? If we had gotten into Y Combinator, I, sh I don't really don't know what the hell I would have done. I don't know if I would have moved to Boston without my wife and kid. Well, what would the kid do, right? I mean, it was just this bizarre thing looking back. Why, why was I doing this? And I think not having a realistic view of, of what you can do as an entrepreneur, as a founder, um, is a very common thing. Right? It's, it's very common to think that since everyone else is doing it, what you read in magazines and TechCrunch and stuff, since they're doing it, that, well, I can do that too. I'm pretty smart. Um, the big question that I asked myself at the time and realized I couldn't, and the big question that I ask entrepreneurs when I sit down with them, is can your, life, can your life really support a startup and what kind of startup? Because right? startup now means like 20 different things. Oops. Whoa. I think I hit the page down button. Apologize. Oh, right. Alright. So, if you really are trying to go for the, the, an angel funded thing where you're going to, or venture backed, and you're going to try to go big, trying to do it on the side for very long is really not going to happen. I mean, you're going to do it for a couple months and then you're going to have to bail. So know that you have to quit your job, that you're potentially going to have to move to the place where your, your funders are. Um, quit your job. You're probably going to work longer weeks than for the 40 hours a week that I was able to. You're probably going to have to take a cut in salary. And uh, frankly, all this sounds great, but if it doesn't meet those personal goals that I talked about, if it doesn't capitalize on your strengths, then you're going to go through this, and if you fail, it's going to suck, because you're going to have given up a bunch of stuff, and you're going to be unhappy. And if it wins, it's going to suck, because you're going to have a bunch of money, and you're still going to fucking be unhappy. So, that's, uh, <laughs> so during this time, I um, got an invoice, which is running in the background. This is why I was like, ah, it's so over this thing. It's 2007. And, uh, and it just kind of kept going. It was selling. I was doing a little maintenance on it, but I wasn't, I wasn't developing and building on it. And uh, it went for a year, because I was trying to pursue other startups. I had no time to do this. I was just handling support. At the end of the year, there was $25,000 in my PayPal account. And I was like, wait, what? Where did this come from? Like, this is crazy. And this was actually my epiphany year, where I was like, okay, so I can do this without doing the thing that we're all supposed to do that Inc. Magazine tells me I have. And so this, this is where my whole, like, um, my approach comes from, basically, of doing smaller ideas. All right, last one. Why you should start marketing the day you start coding. This is, yeah, I've learned this over and over. So it's 2009, I have a half a dozen products and websites. By this time, because I've, I've taken on my approach of having smaller, smaller products. Stopped consulting in 2008 because I was making a full-time income for my products, and uh, my blog started to get pretty popular. And now I live in Boston. My wife's an academic, so we move. We moved a lot. Now we're stationed in California, but every year we've been in a new place. So we're in Boston, and I said, I'm going to write a book because it's going to be fun. And a, a couple of publishers approached me based on my blog. So instead of, this was before like I'd ever heard of MVP, actually, yeah. I said, I'm not going to write a word of this book. I'm going to do this. And this is the landing page I set up in about two hours. And all it is is the title of the book, and it's one sentence that describes it, and then it's like, the book's going to be out in a couple of months. Sign up if you're interested. So without writing a line of code, so to speak, or a, a line of text, um, I got an email list of 600 people. And uh, I did it again. I'm, I'm actually holding a conference in June. This year in Vegas. So we about a month from now. And um, we didn't have a venue and we put up this landing page. And I, we did have the speakers. <laughs> we, we had their permission. So these guys, it's these seats, Andrew Warder, Peter Sean Noah King, Sean Ellis. And we put up this page and we did a similar thing. We didn't have a venue, we didn't put any money out. Because you know, if you try to launch a conference, you sign contracts, you're on the hook for about like 20 grand, 30 grand, depending on what you're doing. We didn't want to do that without knowing that we could sell the seats. 
So we did this. We got an email list, and the conference is a go now. We, we, uh, we proved the concept to ourselves without risking the 20 grand. We started marketing before we started coding, so to speak. I, you, everyone's from Dropbox, right? Um, 200,000 emails. These guys got 200,000 emails from a video. Dropbox, before they launched, was this. It was this page with an email form at the bottom. And I got 200,000. And so, talk about an MVP, right? You got 200,000 emails. Well, let's build this damn thing, because people are going to buy it. Taking it a step further, this is an entrepreneur I work with, um, and he's set building tournament software. Okay, so it's a small niche. And his sales <coughs> website is here. You click the Get Started button, and you see the pricing page, and then you can click Buy Me. And of course, you don't actually buy it. What you do is you get something that says, ah, it's still under development. We're going to be launching soon. This is a little more, it's not just a landing page, right? It's actually, it starts to become a, an entire sales website. It's, it's actually giving the appearance of a product. You have screenshots here. Um, and those are real screenshots. I mean, they're not just fabricated stuff. He has an app, but it just, the app is not done. And so what he learned from this was a lot of things. He started messing with pricing. Because you can test pricing at this point and not piss people off because no one's paying it. So he said, well, my click-through rate goes up if I have this pricing. It goes down if I have this pricing. And he's able to start plotting his curve. This is where AdWords, this is where what he used was AdWords. He used some Facebook ads as well. Um, this is where AdWords comes in really handy because you can turn it on and off very quickly. More to say there, but um, let me see. Yeah, I'm like five minutes. I, so I am wholeheartedly, so I actually came, I adopted this approach from like information marketing um, and some other sources. And I never heard, this was 2007 when I started doing it, and then 2008, and let's see, Lean Startup started, like MVP stuff I started hearing about in 2009. So I call it something different, but it's basically an MVP. You guys have all heard of this. Um, but the biggest objections I hear to this, one is someone might steal my idea if I build this sales website. They're going to steal my tournament software idea. Problem is, if it's that easy to steal, then they're going to do it after you launch, anyways, right? If they can outmarket you and they can, they can beat you. Um, duplicating your code, as we talked about, is not that hard. So it's not, that's not really a good objection. And the other one is, of course, I don't have time to start marketing. I'm too busy writing the product, right? Well, you're going to launch to no one. You know, you, you don't have any idea validation, um, and you're basically coding in a basement, which we all know is, is not a good thing. So why I really, really like this idea, there's a couple things. One, you get an idea about an issue. If Dropbox had gotten 20 emails instead of 200,000, they, perhaps they would not have built it. They would have saved themselves a lot of time. If I had done this with vlogs, perhaps I would have saved myself six months of time. Um, it gives you a marketing reality check because you can, uh, there's people I know who are actually doing SEO and AdWords, and it gives them a really quick indication over the course of, it's a few months, but it's like, they build the site, they start sending traffic to it, and it's like, oh, I can't, I can't afford the AdWords, and I can't do the SEO because it's too competitive. And it's like, okay, even if you have a product and you build it, you're not going to be able to market this thing. Or on the flip, oh, I'm getting thousands of visitors a month from my SEO, I had no idea it was going to be this easy, I'm totally going to do this now. I can even maybe even charge less for it. So it gives you a reality check way before you even have the code. Obviously, an instant beta list. You can just email five people and be like, hey, check this out. I mean, you have this list of people now who are interested in your product. It's like, it's pretty shocking. Definitely, you'll have your best, probably your best day of revenue in the first 12 months if you do this right. Um, I've seen this dozens of times. I've either done it myself or helped entrepreneurs do it. And it typically plays out to be the best revenue day of the first year. If you have a launch list, people who are interested, and you give them a time limited discounted offer, basically. You give them you know, a week to sign up or three days, and you say, it's this price for you for life. And um, if you're that interested in sign up now. And it's good for SEO, actually, to have a sign up for a long time, because it builds links over time. Come to the dark side. I have cookies. Do this. I, I really think there's a lot of value here. I had to zip through this, um, not because I'm short on time, just because it's a big subject. Uh, I wrote a blog post with the same title of why you can start marketing the day you start coding, and I go into a little more depth on my blog. And then uh, I wrote a guest post for Dark Nash uh, on startups. It's called The Five Minute Guide to Cheap Startup Advertising, and that is how I recommend it. I go through Facebook and Influ ads and buy some ads and AdWords and Reddit advertising. These are all things that I've done, and I give you real numbers, and that's how I would drive traffic to this site. 
you'll want to, depending on your market, you'll want to try you know, some, of these, some of these avenues. Um, and then I talk about it in my book, of course. So that wraps me up. Um, like I said, I wrote a book. I'm throwing on a conference. If you guys are interested, um, I can get you a discount code for the conference if anyone's interested in coming. Please feel free to email me. I answer all my emails. Right? Even if you have like, specific questions, I, I love to help people. I try to, do, I try to donate 20% of my time to entrepreneurs for free. So I meet with people, I do Skype calls, and I do uh, email conversations. Um, and that's me on Twitter. Thanks for having me.